Today we're continuing our series called The Truth is Out There. And we've been in this series for a couple weeks talking about what is truth, how do we find it, what do we do with what isn't true. And the reason we're diving into this is that figuring out what is true and what is not true is getting even more difficult, um, especially in our world today. And so we began this series by looking at how Jesus raised the bar on speaking the truth. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, this time when he had huge crowds following him and he gives this long teaching that's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus says this, he says, You have also heard that our ancestors are told, you must not break your vows. But I say, do not make any vows, just a simple, yes I will, or no, I won't. And what Jesus was doing when he gave this teaching is that he is calling his followers to live in a way that our words and our actions do not need any further assurance that we are speaking the truth. We don't need to make a vow. We don't need to swear an oath. We we shouldn't need to try to convince people we're speaking the truth. The way we live our lives should just embody truth. We also talked about how that goes beyond just speaking the truth. It also means being honest about what we do not know and what we cannot know. And so in the first week of the series, we talked about that second part. What do we do when there's things we can't know? And today, we're going to dive into talking about what do we do when we're faced with something and we don't know? Um, How does knowledge uh, factor into truth? Um, How do we learn more about what we know and how do we grow in our knowledge? That's what we're going to focus on today. But before we dive right into that, there is uh, a stereotype about faith. That, that I want to talk about. And that's this stereotype that says, if you believe in God, you have to turn off your brain. And this is often used as an argument against faith of saying that, well, if you're going to believe in a higher power, if you're going to believe in God, if you're going to believe in Jesus, that he rose from the dead and all that goes with it, well, you really just have to turn off your brain if you're going to believe that. Now, that criticism of faith actually comes out of something that that sometimes followers of Jesus say. And it's this definition of faith that honestly I think is quite terrible. And it's this definition that says that faith is blind trust. That faith is just trusting in something whether you know anything about it or not. And that's actually a really terrible definition of what faith is. And there's a slightly better way of phrasing this, but it's still not a great definition. That's saying that faith is believing in what you can't see. Now, this poor definition can get a lot better if we add one more line to it. When we say that faith is believing in what you can't see because of what you can see. See, our faith is actually based off of what we can know, what we can see, what we can see as evidence. And I've, uh, I've done messages before and whole series about evidence for God. And I'm just going to touch really briefly on that right now is to say that one of the evidence pieces that we have that Jesus really is who he said he is, is the fact that there is no reputable scholar that argues that Jesus of Nazareth did not exist. They all say the the historical record, the evidence, the sources outside of the Bible are all way too strong. The only part that they disagree on is the resurrection. Did Jesus really rise from the grave? And one of the the pieces of this that that kind of cements it for me, and maybe this is a piece of evidence that helps you as well if you have questions about who Jesus is, is comes from this knowledge that we have about that time from other sources outside of the Bible, people that had no vested interest in seeing Christianity as true, write and talk about all the other would-be messiahs who existed in the time before and after Jesus, maybe a hundred years each side of Jesus. And each of these would-be messiahs, they often rose up a great following. They'd have people that, that hung on their every word, that people that were ready to die for them, and they would try to overthrow Rome and do the things that they thought the Messiah was supposed to do. And every one of those would-be messiahs ended up killed. In fact, when Pilate had Jesus executed at the demand of the religious leaders, they all expected Jesus' followers to disappear because that's what happened every other time. This was kind of like, oh, here we go again. That's what Pilate, the Roman governor, thought. That's what the religious leaders thought. We kill this guy, his followers disappear, things go back to normal. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, There was a group of about 120 of them that were gathered in Jerusalem when the Holy Spirit arrived. 
And Peter gives a great sermon and 3,000 people put their trust in Jesus that day. And from that time point in about AD 33 to AD 313, so just under 300 years later when Christianity gets granted official protection as a religious belief by the Roman Empire, in that time period when Christianity was persecuted, um, estimates are that up to one-third or maybe even slightly more than one-third of the Roman Empire had put their trust in Jesus. Every other would-be Messiah, their followers scattered and disappeared, but not Jesus's. In fact, our, the fact that we are still here, that the church still stands today, is evidence of who Jesus is. And that's why I come to this last definition of faith, and this is the one that I work on the most is that faith is informed trust. That as we learn more, as we dive into knowing who God is and who Jesus is and even the history that surrounds Scripture, that all of that leads us to have a stronger sense of trust in who God is and why we can believe that God will do what he's promised he will do. Because if we go back to that first, that that poor definition of saying that faith is blind trust, That's actually something that Jesus spoke about and spoke against. There's this time period in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus was interacting with the Pharisees and he ticked them off. Um, That was a common occurrence for Jesus. And the disciples come to him and they say, do you realize you offended the Pharisees by what you said? Now, of course Jesus knows he did that. He offended them all the time. And Jesus replies, every plant not planted by my heavenly father will be uprooted, so ignore them. He says, their whole system of legalism and rules will be uprooted, so just ignore them. And then Jesus says this about the Pharisees. He says, they are blind guides leading the blind, and if one blind person guides another, they will both fall into a ditch. So why would we want our faith to be blind if it's just going to lead us to fall into a ditch? See, Jesus taught constantly. In fact, Jesus constantly used teaching and preaching to inspire a changed life amongst his followers. That's the main thing that he did in his ministry was he taught. He taught people about God. He taught people what God was going to do. He gave them promises of what God would do in the future. And that teaching was always meant to actually help his followers follow him. You know, when Jesus teaches, he was imparting knowledge and wisdom into his followers. Knowledge is actually a critical part of faith, that as we learn more about God, it helps us follow him. Now, there's a common saying that maybe you've heard this before. Um, This isn't a proverb from scripture, but it's kind of one of those common proverbs in our world today, and it's this one. It says, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And I've been curious about this phrase. And so I kind of did some research into its history and found out something kind of fascinating. In this phrase dates all the way back to the 1600s. And in the 1600s, the Western world is moving out of the Renaissance and into the Age of Enlightenment. It's going to lead to the beginning of the modern era as we know it. And in um, uh, 1698, there's this collection of letters that gets published. And all we know about the author is his initials were A, B. And he writes this. He says, "'Twas well observed by my Lord Bacon that a little knowledge is apt to puff up and make men giddy, but a greater share of it will set them right and bring them, low, bring them to low and humble thoughts of themselves." Now, when he says Lord Bacon, he's referring to a guy named Sir Francis Bacon. And Sir Francis Bacon uh, was the Lord High Chancellor of England. He was a statesman, a politician, a philosopher, uh, and he wrote quite extensively. And so A.B. is referring to an earlier work by Sir Francis Bacon. He says, you know, he observed this, that a little bit of knowledge puffs people up. It makes them full of themselves. But a greater share of knowledge leads to humility, leads to more accurate understanding. And what he's basing this off of, the closest quote we have to this from Sir Francis Bacon, goes back to the beginning of the 1600s, when he wrote this in his essays about atheism. He said, A little philosophy inclineth man's mind to atheism, but depth in philosophy bringeth men's minds about to religion. 
He's saying philosophy, how understanding how we think and how we see the world. A little bit of it causes you to see the world as just natural selection, as just atheism. Now, natural selection hadn't been discovered or understood at this point of time, but you get what I mean. He says, but a depth in philosophy, a deeper dive into understanding how our minds and how we think and how we can know things leads us towards belief in God. Now, Sir Francis Bacon was a devout Anglican. And he gave many works, and we're going to talk about one of his other works in just a moment. But before that, there's one more evolution of this quote. Um, And this comes uh, from the early 1700s, an English poet named Alexander Pope. He's the one who puts it closest to the form we know this as today, where he says, A little learning is a dangerous thing. Shallow draughts intoxicate the brain, and drinking largely sobers us again. Now, he's a poet. He's making a little turn of a phrase here. But he's saying that a little sip of knowledge intoxicates us, makes us feel full of ourselves, makes us feel boisterous, makes us feel like, you know, we're on top of the world but drinking largely of knowledge sobers us again, brings us to level-headed and clear thinking. See, in each of these, this is the fuller example of that quote. It's not just a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, but a lot of knowledge is a good thing. He says, instead of, so here's the way I want to kind of phrase this question. Instead of being dangerous, what if a little bit of knowledge could lead us to ask more questions and encourage us to learn? What if a taste of knowledge inspires us to dig deeper rather than to feel full of ourselves? And so I want to take us to something else that Sir Francis Bacon wrote and something else that he did. And and he is known today, and he's kind of famous for this, is that his writings form the basis of what we call today the modern scientific method. Now, if the scientific method sounds uh, familiar to you, it's probably because you may have learned about it in grade school. And so let's go back to grade school for a moment and, and look at what the scientific method, the, the building blocks that Sir Francis Bacon wrote, became today. And it's this process of how we can learn. It says we've got to start by making an observation, then we ask a question about it, we form a hypothesis, which is a testable explanation. Then we make a prediction, we test that prediction, And then we examine our results. We make a new hypothesis or a new prediction out of it. And this seems kind of like a cycle. But let me give you an example. Let's say this morning you got up, you went to make breakfast, and you wanted to make toast. You put bread in the toaster, you pushed the tab down, and nothing happened. Your bread remained bread. And so you make an observation. The observation is my toaster failed to turn bread into toast. And so you ask a question, well, why is my toaster not working? And so step three is you form a hypothesis. What is something you can test that might get you an answer? And so maybe that circuit got tripped. Maybe that outlet doesn't have power. And so you form a prediction. If I plug the toaster into a different outlet, maybe it'll work. And so then you get to step five. You test the prediction. You unplug the toaster from that outlet. You plug it into a different one on a different circuit. And you see, does it make toast? And then if it does make toast, okay, now you got to go find out why that circuit got tripped. But if it doesn't make toast, and you still just end up with plain old bread, then you have to form a new hypothesis. Well, maybe the toaster itself is broken. Maybe something else is. See, we follow the scientific method almost every time we have to troubleshoot or figure out a problem. We just don't know that's what we do. And that's why something that uh, Francis Bacon wrote about in the 1600s is still practiced today because he just codified the way that our minds solve problems. In fact, the scientific method's purpose is to advance a little bit of knowledge into greater knowledge and then into even further questions that will lead into more knowledge and more questions. And so the scientific method is really a cycle that keeps on going. And, and even today, when, uh, a science, when a new paper gets released and they're like, oh, hey, you know, something we thought we knew before turns out to be wrong, that doesn't mean that bad science happened. That means the scientific method is working, that we are pushing towards deeper and greater and further knowledge. But the scientific method has some limits. The scientific method can only study what is observable in the natural physical world, and if we can develop a controllable experiment 
to test its hypothesis. And so we can observe, did bread turn into toast or did it stay as bread? And we can control the experiment by isolating one variable at a time. I'll plug the toaster into a different uh, outlet. But the scientific method breaks down when we try to use it to study something that goes beyond the natural physical world. In fact, God exists beyond the constraints of our natural physical world. We talk about how God is supernatural, means he is beyond what is natural. And so we can't create experiments, we can't create hypotheses and control all the variables to learn about God. The scientific method falls apart if we try to use it to study something that exists in the supernatural as in how God exists. And so how do we study and know God? If we want to have that informed trust, what's something we can do to learn more about who God is? And, and for this, I want to take us back uh, in history to a little later than Sir Francis Bacon. I want to take us um, to a guy named John Wesley who lived in the 1700s. And John Wesley uh, is known as kind of the father of the Methodist movement. If you know a little bit about church history, maybe you've heard of the Methodists. Um, And he came up, he really wrestled with this question a lot. How do we study and know God? And so he came up with something called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. quadrilateral. Um, And you don't need to remember that term. But usually it's it's described as a a square, as kind of like a trapezoid-shaped figure. But there's a different way of describing it that I want to show to you, and that's this. That the Wesleyan quadrilateral combines four things together. And when we combine these things together, this is how we can learn more about who God is. And so he starts with this foundation of Scripture. Scripture is the big one that surrounds everything. That Scripture, um, having the context, the genre, the history, reading Scripture well, forms the basis for what we can know about God. But on top of that, there's these three other things that work together and are all part of this together. Um, And the first one is reason, is being able to think, being able to use the intelligence that God gave us, being able to think logically. And uh, John Wesley believed that the Holy Spirit's role was to guide our reason, to guide our reason as we read Scripture, to guide our reason as we figure things out. But then there's also things like experience. What is our experience and our encounters with God? Um, As we pray, when maybe God speaks and we listen, um, encounters we have with God fall under this realm of experience. And then the, the fourth piece of the quadrilateral was tradition. Now, tradition means both history, what has the church previously believed, but sometimes there are beliefs that the church held in the past that we find out kind of maybe weren't right. And, we've, and our understanding of the history will evolve and change over time. But the other part of tradition, um, and this is what I think was so brilliant about what John Wesley came up with, is that he believed that part of this also involved community. That you actually can't just work a quadrilateral and, and study scripture in isolation. It has to be done in community. And how that shapes and affects us as we discuss and as we work through scripture together becomes part of this. And so when all these things blend together, somewhere in the middle here is where we find the truth that leads us closer to God. See, what Wesley knew and understood is that all these things together, they reveal more about God. They grow our theology. And theology just means the study of God. But he knew this. He said that our lives as disciples of Jesus, ought to lead us to ask more questions and desire a deeper knowledge of God. Because as our knowledge of God grows, the way we live our lives changes and shapes, and we become able to follow Jesus and to uh, affect the change in the world that God has us here to do. And this is something um, that we, we see in Scripture. In fact, if we go to near late in the New Testament, there's this a letter called Hebrews. And we don't know exactly who wrote Hebrews, but we do know who it was written to. We know it was written to a group of followers of Jesus who were considering abandoning their faith and returning to Judaism. And so um, this letter that was probably written as a speech, um, it's maybe more like a transcript of a speech than a formal letter, 
But partway through this, the author of Hebrews says this. He says, you have been believers so long now that you ought to be teaching others. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. And so he's saying that, he's saying to this group of believers, you have followed Jesus long enough that you should be teaching others by now. You should have moved on to this solid food that's for those who are mature. And he is kind of calling out this group that was likely friends of his, that they, they had a relationship, they could call him out on this, of saying that you haven't d- dived into knowing more about God. You need to move to the solid food. And here's kind of the main point that I'm getting to in this, is that whether we realize it or not, the decisions that we make, how we live our lives, expose both the strengths and the shortcomings of what we know and believe about God. Now, I'm speaking specifically to people who are followers of Jesus. Um, if, you're, if you found this video or maybe someone shared it with you and sent it to you uh, to encourage you to kind of check out and learn about faith, well, thank you for sticking with me uh, through this. But I'm speaking specifically to people who say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Because it's a kind of a scary thought to think that the decisions and the way we live our lives, what we say, how we act, what we post on Facebook, Uh, what we share on social media, those things expose both the strengths and the shortcomings of what we know and believe about God. But the problem is, is that sometimes, even as we push for knowledge, even as we push to grow in our relationship with God, we push to grow in our understanding, sometimes we miss the forest for the trees. We focus in on some minute detail and we think that's what will lead us to knowing Jesus more. And we miss the bigger picture of what God has been doing. There's a simple test to figure out if we've missed the forest. And that's this one. That further knowledge of God always leads us to become more loving and more gracious as we discover God's love and grace towards us. Knowledge is wonderful. Knowledge is great. But knowledge is really only worth it if it leads us to love. In fact, Jesus was asked this one of these times by the Pharisees, one of these times that he ticked them off. They asked him, what's the most important commandment in all of the law of Moses? And Jesus replies, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then he says, a second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. This is what Jesus says, that loving God and as our knowledge of God shapes and guides us, reveals those strengths about who we are as we learn about how God loves us, it will lead us to love our neighbor as ourselves. This this is why truth matters. Because in our quest for truth, in our quest for understanding, in our quest for knowledge, Jesus knows it will lead us to love. And so there's a question we have to ask ourselves. Is our knowledge of God leading us to become more loving to others? Is what we know about who God is, what we know about our faith, is it shaping us to act in love to everyone we meet? And I hope that's a question that you can wrestle with this week. Uh, maybe have a conversation with someone about. Uh, or you, if you have questions about this more, you could fill out our online Connect card and get in touch with me. And I'd love to have a conversation with you or send an email to the church. Um, because this is why truth matters. Because truth will lead us to loving others. Now next week, we are going to wrap up this series. And we're going to have a fun one because we're going to talk about what do we do about false teaching. Um, Uh, Some big chunks of the New Testament deal with false teaching. And these people that were traveling around teaching churches the wrong thing about God. And what do we do about that? And so we're going to dive into that and have some fun with it next week. But I want to give you a little preview of what's happening the week after that. We are launching into a new series um, in two weeks called Talking Points. The perfect blend of politics and religion. Now, when I told someone uh, this week that I was going to be doing a series on this coming up, Um, Their response to me was, well, you're only doing this series now because it's online. Uh, And I said, no, 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 no. I really um, wish I was doing this series uh, with everyone in the room here together. And we are making some big progress towards that. 
Um, every week we're making more progress towards when we'll be able to launch our in-person services uh, and have our live stream available for anyone at home. But we're doing this series and we're diving into it. Um, it's going to make us uncomfortable, but I also believe it's going to make us better. That this is about equipping us to have better conversations and uh, better discussions about politics and faith. Um, so that's coming up in two weeks. Uh, and uh, I, just I hope you have a great week. I hope that you wrestle with some of these questions. And I hope that we look for ways um, that our knowledge can lead us to love others better. So I hope you have a great week. See you online next Sunday.